Worthy is your name, Jesus. We just sang the song, my friends. Is the name of Jesus worthy when I am going through a problem? What about when I have some kind of a problem at work? Maybe you're in college, school. Is the name of Jesus worthy when you're going through some tribulation? The name of Jesus is worthy regardless. And my friends, as we were singing, I think our hearts, our souls, they were just stretching out to Jesus because he is our king, our savior. And just, I think we just want to connect more and press more into Jesus, regardless, regardless of what I am going through and regardless of what you're going through. My friends, and even today, the message that I have on my heart, this woman that we will discuss and talk about, she worshiped Jesus. Even though the situation around her didn't appear to be worthy, she worshiped Jesus because Jesus' name, because Jesus is, is the one that is worthy of all praise, glory, honor forever and ever. I'd like to begin with this story I heard a few years back. There was this man, and he was in a dark room. And he had a marble, maybe something similar like this. And he had this marble, and I don't know if this was a prison cell or what it was, I can't recall, but he was there alone. And he just had this marble, and he was just tossing it up and down. And maybe he wouldn't catch it, and he would hear as it dropped somewhere, and he would find it in the dark. And once again, he would take the marble, throw it up, and he would do this over and over again. But one time he grabs this marble and as he throws it up, he does not hear it fall. It's disappeared. Where did it go? What happened? And we began to question and he began probably to even question in himself. And if you or I were in that situation, all of a sudden so many questions would flood our minds. Because we as people, we think logically. We as people, we like to think very analytically. We like to analyze the situation and try to give answers for the situation. And we'll return back to this story. But I'd like to, I'd like to recall something from my life and, as my, and uh, my family's life. As my wife and I, we were a few days ago just kind of discussing something. We were talking about the time that we live in right now. The time, the period that we, me and you, live in currently. And we were also talking about the time when our parents grew up. The time of our gr grandparents. We were talking about the persecution and the difficulty that they faced. And as we were discussing, we were trying to think to ourselves, which of these periods is more pleasing and which one is more difficult to live in? And as, as we begin to analyze the situations, we begin to think, yes, persecution is difficult. I'm talking about the persecution uh, during the communist times, during the Soviet times, when, when our grandfathers, when our fathers, parents, they were going through difficulties, whether that was in schools, whether that was forbidden to gather as we are here today, whether that was something else they had this persecution and they could not do some things. They couldn't even go to college because of the different reasons that they were Christians, because they professed Christ. And so as we were kind of thinking about this, we were thinking to ourselves, were they more on fire for Christ than us today? And is it better and easier for us to be Christians today living in freedom or is it easier for them to be Christian. And of course, there's two sides. Nobody wants persecution. I don't want persecution. And I think no one here wants persecution. None of us would like to be persecuted and thrown into prison and maybe something else and maybe somebody even beheaded for Christ. But on the other hand, those kind of situations may push us to press more into God. And so as we were discussing this this came to mind, my father-in-law, when he was in the army, he would share a story how the, the guys, they would just gather together, maybe like once a week or something, and they would gather together to watch a movie. Not quite like this, because they probably didn't have theaters, and the screen was probably the big box, black and white, you know? But they would gather together to watch this movie, and my father-in-law said, you know, I loved that time. It was such a good time for, for, for that gathering. You know why? It wasn't because of the movie. 
And you know, it wasn't even because he could just be there with the guys and just enjoy himself. No, he said when they would gather to watch that movie, he would just close his eyes and he would just connect with the Lord. And as he was sharing this, you know, it brings tears to my eyes because, because he said the connection with the Lord was so deep. He didn't even hear the movie. He didn't hear the things that are, that are going on around him. And as I hear this, I begin to question myself. My connection with the Lord, my pressing into the Lord, am I always seeking just for that opportunity to connect with my King, with my God, with my Savior? Even when it seems like there is not a chance to, to go and just press into God, do I, do I seek and find that time? It was a difficult time, but he found that moment when everybody was just enjoying themselves. When the entertainment was all around, he pressed into God. He was seeking God. And this really touches my heart, my friends. And as the people, as my parents, I remember they shared, they said, you know, when, when there was persecution, when there was difficulty, we all thought there was different prophecies and we all thought freedom will come. It's going to be such a great time. We can just gather freely. We can rejoice. We can enjoy. We can have such a great time and joy in Christ. And we do have great time right now. And we do have all the different gatherings and camps and conferences, and we ought to. And this is good. And this is for our growth. But then again, the question remains, my relationship with Christ, do I have that same kind of a pressing into God as my fathers and our grandparents? Or perhaps... I can seek him more today. Do I seek and persist in such a manner like we hear today from those people testifying? Or maybe something has taken a turn. Maybe I need to, need to return back to that true love that the scripture speaks about. Maybe I need to press more and more into Jesus Christ. And so my friends, it's up to us to decide whether it's more difficult or easier to live in this time than it was for our parents, regardless of the situation, we were placed, we were born in this time. And God desires to have fellowship with each of us, regardless of the period, regardless of the time that we live in. Jesus. It says, for God so loved the world. Jesus loves each of us and wants to have that kind of a relationship where I rely, where I worship and say, worthy is your name, Jesus, regardless of the situation around me, regardless of this persecution or freedom, Jesus, your name is worthy. And I will continue to press into you. I will be persistent. I will continue to seek you because your name is worthy, Jesus. And so my friends, living in this time of freedom, I'm thankful to the Lord, but I want to encourage myself and each of us to press more and more into Jesus Christ. I'm not saying that there weren't any kind of terrors among the church in the times of persecution. Of course, there could have been people that were living a double, double life and helping the KGB and all these other things. But let us watch that we are not among the tares, but among the wheat, the good wheat that will be gathered on that day. I'd like to read my uh, text, the central text for my uh, message today that I have on my heart. This will be the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 15, verse 21, and a few verses down. Then Jesus went out from there and departed to the region of Tyre and Sidon. And behold, a woman of Canaan came from that region and cried out to him, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. My daughter is severely demon-possessed. But he answered her not a word. And his disciples came and urged him, saying, Send her away, for she cries out after us. But he answered and said, I was not sent except to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Then she came and worshipped him, saying, Lord, help me. But he answered and said, It is not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the little dogs. And she said, yes, Lord, yet even the little dogs eat the crumbs which fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered and said to her, O woman, great is your faith. Let it be to you as you desire. And her, and her daughter was healed from that very hour. My friends, just a little bit of background 
before we jump into what's taking place here. This situation takes place in the, in the region or the territory of Tyre and Sidon. And if we look deeper into the scriptures and study the history, we can see that this territory was Gentile territory or region. Meaning Gentile, meaning people that are not Jewish. And so Jesus, he's coming into this territory. But the interesting part is Jesus was a rabbi or a teacher. And the Jews, they looked at these people as if they were unclean people. And in fact, to even be around someone unclean might defile you being as a Jew. And so this was not something typical they would do. And it's interesting because Jesus is the one, the one that goes into this territory. It's something very um, out of the ordinary, you could say. But the story even has more surprises with it. As we continue to read, Matthew, the one who wrote this gospel, he, he begins to say that this woman, she was a Canaanite woman. And when we look at the history, we can find the Canaanites throughout the Old Testament, like all over the place. And we find them all the way back from when Canaan, the grandson of Noah, was born. And then there was a time when he was cursed by Noah. I'm not going to get into that story right now, but these are the descendants of Canaan. And we continue to see that these descendants, the Canaanites, they would live in the promised land. And then God, God took the people of Israel, brought them back out of Egypt into this promised land. And these ones were driven out, but perhaps some were left behind. And so these are those Canaanites. And when we look at that relationship that these Jews had with the Canaanites, it wasn't the best kind of a relationship. It was a very, very difficult kind of a relationship because, because they were enemies. There was one part of scripture that I recall in uh, when David, he actually made alliance with uh, the people of Tyre and they went, uh, they went against the Philistines. But that was because they had a common enemy. So they made an alliance. But for the most part in scriptures, we can see that these people, they are the enemies. They are, and so the Jews, they considered them unclean. In fact, they would even call such people dogs. And so this relationship was very, very difficult. And so Matthew, he specifically calls out this woman as a Canaanite. Now, when we read the same part of scripture or the same story, I should say, in the gospel of Mark, Mark says that this woman, she was a Syrophoenician woman. And when we dig deeper into history here, we can see that this city that she was living in, this place, it was Phoenicia. And the reason is Syrophoenician because, because she, this, this place belonged to the district or the region of Syria. So she was a woman of Syrophoenician. And so there's no conflict between the two. Sometimes people say, oh, scriptures contradict. They don't. The reason why the different gospel writers call this woman differently is because of their audience. And we know that Matthew, he's, he's uh, uh, writing his gospel to the Jews, and he's trying to convince them that Jesus Christ is the Messiah. But Mark, on the other hand, he's writing to the Gentiles, to the Romans. And so he has a different purpose. And so this woman was indeed a Canaanite. She was a descendant of Canaan. But she was also a Syrophoenician because she lived in that place. And so the reason why Matthew calls this woman a Canaanite is very, very specific to the Jews. If you and I were a first century Jew reading this, this would bring a lot of memories for me and maybe some uncomfortable feelings because I would know these are my enemies and Jesus is going to them. And he brings this story and Matthew speaks, how does Jesus treat these people, this woman? So that's just a little bit of background and context for us so we can kind of feel the story more. So Jesus, he responds to this woman with, three with, uh, with four responses. There's four responses that he responds. The first is silence, meaning he does not say anything. And the second thing that he says is, I was sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. The third thing that he says is, it is not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the little dogs. And finally, Jesus responds, O oh woman, great is your faith. Let it be to you as you desire. So the first one, silence. When we look at Jesus and when we read the scriptures, we see Jesus as a loving kind of a God person. We see that he always, people would bring the sick to him and he would always heal them. 
He would stretch out his hand and heal them and help them in all these different situations. Jesus was always there. He's a loving Jesus. And indeed, he is a loving Jesus. So what's different here? Why doesn't Jesus just turn to the woman and cast the demon out and help this woman because her daughter is demon-possessed? He's just going on the road and he's ignoring her. Anybody like to be ignored? Is it a good feeling? No, you know, they, they even sometimes say that sometimes it's easier to hear a, an answer regardless of what it is, whether it's affirmative or not. Maybe it's a negative or a positive response, but sometimes it's easier to hear some kind of a response rather than just hear nothing. Being ignored can be very difficult and it can hurt. And sometimes we actually experience this in our prayer lives with God. Anybody experience that? When you're just, you're imploring, you're pleading to God, you're calling out to God and you're, you're just there weeping before him. But it seems like heaven is closed. It seems like, it seems like the situation, that, that difficulty that you're in, no answer is coming and you need an answer now. And you're just calling out to God and you're there in your prayer closet. But the answer is silence. There's no response. And sometimes we experience that. There was Job, if you guys recall from the Old Testament. And he likewise had a similar situation. He experienced some silence from God. His three friends, they came to comfort him in that difficulty that he was going through. And they came to even um, maybe help him. But you know that support? It was actually destruction to him. It was very painful to him. And then all of a sudden, Job is going through this difficulty and his friends come and press on him also. But there's silence. I mean, eventually God did respond and God spoke. But there was that period of time when I think Job just, just kept on pressing in and was so persistent, but there was no response. I think it wasn't easy. That silence was very difficult. He's probably saying, you know, God, vindicate me but nothing's happening. Or if we read the, what the words the, the psalmists say, the psalms, we can find very often that David, he says, Lord, vindicate me. Lord, uh, hear me. I cry out to you. Help me. And there's moments in those different parts of scriptures where we can hear that cry of theirs and it seems like the heavens are closed. It seems like it's just silent and there's no response. If we remember Lazarus, there was a moment when he became sick. And if you remember, they, his friends, his close ones, maybe relatives, I can't remember who it was, they sent to Jesus and said, hey, come quickly. Your friend Lazarus, he's sick. And in fact, he's close to death. Please come heal him quickly. Imagine the situation. Mary and Martha, they're just waiting there. They're like, yes, Jesus will come soon. Everything's going to be okay. But Jesus is delaying. Jesus is not coming. And they're like, man, what's the delay? Come on, Jesus, this is urgent. I mean, obviously, I'm kind of imagining now. But, you know, they probably had some kind of thoughts come through. They're like, what is going on? This is such a crucial moment. Lazarus is about to die. But when we read the Gospel of John, it says that Jesus intentionally Delayed, And of course, that was to glorify the Father. But for Mary and Martha, that was like a period of silence. That was like a period of, we don't understand what's going on. Why? Jesus, come on. Can't you hurry up a little bit? And the silence remained. Finally, Lazarus dies. And Jesus, he speaks to his disciples, and he says, hey, let's go heal. Let's go uh, see Lazarus because he's uh, fallen asleep. The disciples are completely confused. So Jesus finally just straight up says, he died. And they go. But I think that was a difficult moment. That struggle for Mary, for Martha, I think it was not easy. And so sometimes in our lives, we receive that same kind of a response just silence. We don't hear anything 
and the heavens, they seem like they're closed. And this Canaanite woman, she receives just silence. The response is just silence. When we go to the second response, we see that Jesus, and in fact, he doesn't speak to the woman this time. He turns to his disciples. It's as if he's continuing to ignore her and he speaks of her. We typically don't like that either. When somebody, you know, is talking about us right here and, you know, it just doesn't feel quite comfortable. Not addressing her personally, but he says to his disciples, I was sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. The disciples, they're already annoyed that this woman is following. They're like, you know, come on, Jesus, just, just send her away. Make this all happen, you know. They've seen Jesus heal and help so many people. They're like, you know, just do it again. This is annoying already. But Jesus turns to his disciples and says, you know, she's not my mission. My goal is the lost sheep of Israel. And imagine this woman just listening from the side, right? That probably was pretty difficult to hear. Jesus says, my mission, what I was sent for is the lost sheep of Israel. But this woman, she's persistent. She continues to press into Jesus. She continues, and it surprises me, being a Gentile. She wasn't brought up in the Jewish kind of uh, family. And she doesn't uh, know maybe all the different scriptures that the Jews would study, the Torah and all the other things. She doesn't maybe even know about the Messiah, but somehow she's learned. Somehow she's heard about this. And somehow this woman, she seeks out Jesus. She finds out he's coming to, to my town or my city. And she finds Jesus. And she believes in Jesus as the Messiah. And do you know how I know that? Because she says, Lord, son of David. She's acknowledging him straight up. You are the Messiah, and I, I plead to you. I call out to you. Jesus, help me. It surprises me, that approach that she has, that faith, such great faith that she has. And she's, she's demonstrating her faith in words and in actions, and she's persisting in following Jesus. And then there's silence. And finally, there's a second response. Jesus is saying, you know, she's not my mission but she continues to persevere after Jesus. She continues to follow him and she continues to implore, Jesus, help me. <clears throat> you know, it surprises me, this situation, you would think this kind of faith would really impress Jesus and surprise him. Remember the centurion, the one that, that was commander of many soldiers, of 100 soldiers, when he came to Jesus and he said, heal my servant. Jesus says, okay, I'll come. I'll come to your house. And he's like, you know, Jesus, I'm not even worthy for you to come under my roof. In other words, to come into my house because I'm not worthy of you. And Jesus was impressed. Jesus was surprised, astonished, it says, of his faith. Because the soldier said, the centurion said, just a word. Jesus, all you got to do is just that one word, my servant is healed. And Jesus was surprised of that. Why not here? There's silence. Then this woman continues to persist. She presses in. Then she hears that she's not the mission. And she continues. Why is Jesus still not surprised? So that was the second response. She's not my mission. One preacher, he said that these same words that this woman was using, Lord, help me. Lord, help me. These are the same words that we often find the men of God using. These are the same words the psalmists use. How did this woman know? Some kind of faith was built up in her. And she pleads and says, Lord, help me. She clearly believes this is Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God. So was Jesus careless to her? Does Jesus not love her? Jesus himself said when he was speaking to Nicodemus, he said, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. He spoke of himself, the son. He spoke of himself, for God so loved the world. God loves each and every person that he gave his son. Jesus loved this woman. And indeed, he, he loves regardless, Canaanite, Jew, Gentile, regardless of what race I am and you are, Jesus loves us. So what's going on here? I think there was something else happening here. I think Jesus is being there in human form at the time. He says, I was sent to the people of Israel. And perhaps a second thing, maybe this woman's 
faith is under trial. Maybe this woman's faith is under trial. You know, I personally think that this, this situation, Jesus came specifically to that place for this woman. And the reason I say so is because as I was studying the scriptures and looking at the two different accounts where this is written, I found that it says Jesus went into Tyre and Sidon. And then after this entire story with this woman, and then it says, and then he departed from there. And Mark says the same thing. Perhaps the scriptures leave something out, but to me it seems as if Jesus came for this woman. He specifically went there for this woman. And so Jesus knew all these things. He's the all-knowing God. He knew this would take place. So maybe this woman's faith was just being tested. He knew this woman would come to her and plead and ask for mercy. I'm remembering the parable about the persistent widow. These are also the words of Jesus. Then he spoke a parable to them that men always ought to pray and not lose heart, saying, there was a certain city, there was in a certain city a judge who did not fear God nor regard man. Now there was a widow in that city, and she came to him saying, get justice for me for my adver adversary. And he would not for a while, but afterwards he said within himself, though I do not fear God nor regard man, Yet because the wi this widow troubles me, I will avenge her, lest by her continual coming she weary me. Then the Lord said, Hear what the unjust judge says, and shall God not avenge his own elect who cry out day and night to him? Though he bears long with them, I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he really find faith on earth. You know, this was a parable that Jesus shared about being persistent, about continually pressing into God. Just like this woman, she continues and continues and presses in, not looking at the situation, not looking at the fact that maybe, maybe she's being ignored, maybe she's not the mission of Jesus. She doesn't care about that. She continues to press in. She continues to cry out to Jesus. She continues to worship Jesus and maybe even bow down before him. She continues. And this is what Jesus is saying. We, we should continue to per persist and call out to God. We should continue to press into God. We should continue to seek him regardless of the situation. Because God says, you know, if a judge that is wicked like that one would help a widow that persists, will I not help my children who call out day and night? God will come through. God will help. We already mentioned that the Canaanites, they were enemies of Israel. And since, since the time they were going into the promised land, and maybe even before, they were enemies and they were treated in such a manner. And the Jews, they would call them perhaps even dogs and maybe other words. But what is Jesus doing here? If we look at the third point here, it is not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the little dogs. So is Jesus doing the same thing that the Israelites would do towards their enemies? You know, I was thinking about this. I don't think Jesus is just following that trend. Just because they're enemies, I'm going to call them dogs. And in fact, if we, this, this specific translation, the New King James says little dogs. Most other translations say dogs. But when we read the Slavic translations, it says um, little dogs also. And when we look at the Greek translation, it's like a little dog, like a puppy. But, you know, that doesn't really soften the situation. Imagine somebody calling you a puppy. You know, it doesn't feel good. Being called a dog is bad, but being called a puppy doesn't feel much better, really. You know, but I think Jesus is doing something else here. I think he's re-emphasizing what he just spoke to the disciples. Remember, he said, I was sent to the lost sheep of Israel. And so when he says, it's not good to take children's bed, he's saying, you know, I can't just take the children's bed and give it to someone else, to the dogs that are worth much less. He's saying, my mission is the people of Israel, the lost sheep of Israel. So he's re-emphasizing this to the woman. And of course, 
this might have been pretty painful to the woman because nobody wants to be called a puppy or a dog. So regardless of the situation, this could have been painful. But I don't think Jesus is doing this to follow that trend because they are my enemies. I will say this. No, he's trying to say something else here. And as he's doing this, he's saying, he's saying, it's not good to do this. But the, the, the response of this woman, it just astonishes me. And this woman just has such deep humility. I mean, we look at her response and she's like, Lord, you know, I'm that puppy. But you know what? That puppy, he continues to eat the little crumbs that fall on the ground from the master's table. The children, they're eating the whole dinner, the feast. They're enjoying themselves. There's little crumbs that are falling. And that puppy is eating those little crumbs. And you know, that puppy, he's, he deserves those things. And so do I. She acknowledges that she's nothing. That's pretty deep humility. That faith that has been moving her through the time of silence, through the time of not being the mission, that faith continues to move her and say, you know what? Yes, I am nothing, God, but still I deserve just those crumbs. They will be adequate for me. The little, little crumbs are sufficient for me. Just give me those little crumbs because the puppy deserves them. And if I'm that puppy, I deserve them. And so she continues to press into Jesus. She continues to press into Jesus. You know, if I were in that situation, man, I think when I, when I heard Jesus say to the disciples, I'd probably already go away. I'd be like, what? I'm not the mission? But no, she continues to press into Jesus even after being called this puppy. And so finally, Jesus says, Oh woman, great is your faith. Let it be to you as you desire. And so my friends, in our situation, we can, we can have maybe some similarities here. Maybe we're pressing in. Maybe we're going through some kind of a trial. Maybe we're going through some kind of a problem and it seems to us there's no response from heaven. It seems to us God is not responding to us. Maybe we just continue to be persistent, continue to press in to Jesus Christ. Continue to call out to him, Lord, help me. Help me, son of David. Help me, Jesus, because you are my savior. You are my Messiah. I am your son. I am your daughter. I plead to you. I call out to you in the midst of this situation, and I know you will come through. You know, is God almighty? Of course. Is God all-knowing? Yes. Is God everywhere? Yeah, he, this is God. He's almighty. He's all of these things. And this, these are not just his attributes. This is his being. He knows what you're going through. So why should I even call out to him? What's the point? Does God not know the problem I have? Does God not know the situation I'm going through? Does God not know what I'm struggling with? Yeah, he knows. So why call out? You know, the scriptures call us to this. Jesus calls us to this, to be persistent, to continue to bring our cares, our needs, all these things that we have to God. Yes, God knows. But there's a different kind of a relationship. God, I bring this to you. Yes, I know, but I plead with you. I bring this to you. Even though you're all knowing, I still continue to press into you. I still continue to bring these different needs, these problems, these struggles to you, Jesus Christ. Remember Jacob. He had that time when he was wrestling with the Jehovah angel or with God. And different translations say angel or God. But regardless, he had that time when he was battling God. You know what's interesting? I think that battle was not as much physical as it was spiritual. When we read the prophet Hosea, he speaks of this battle. And these are the words he says. Yes, he struggled with the angel and prevailed. He wept and sought favor from him. What kind of a battle was this? I think it was a very much spiritual battle. He was battling, weeping. He was seeking for God's favor. This is the kind of a battle. He was wrestling with God. He was persistent and he continued to press in. I will not let go until you bless. And so the scriptures call us to have that kind of a relationship with God, to, to continue to press in, to continue to seek after God, to continue to stand on his promises, on, his, on faith in him, to continue to reassure and even remind God of all the things that he promised me and you, to continue to stand on these things, 
even if all stakes are set against me, even it seems, if it seems like there's no answer from heaven, even if it seems like this problem is bigger than I can carry, to continue to press into God. Maybe God is near. Maybe God is right next to me. Maybe God is even in the midst of that situation, but I don't see him. But I will continue. I will press in. I will seek, and I will receive a response because Jesus Christ will come through and help his children. My friends, this is what God is teaching us. He's, t- he's telling us, maybe I'm going through some kind of a trial. Maybe it's a difficulty that I need to be tested with. But we will continue to press in. Remember Abraham, his faith was tested. He was very close to God. He was a friend of God and he had literally fellowship with God. And then God visited him in the face of the angels and all these other things. But there was that moment when God came to him and said, you know, take your son and bring him as an offering, as a sacrifice to me. I think hearing those words was not easy for Abraham. And you know, I think there was a battle, literally some kind of a wrestling going on inside of him. Like, really, God, come on. This is my only son, literally. But he continued to obey God. He continued to follow what God had told him, what God asked of him, because he cherished that relationship more and he trusted. It says that he believed He had that faith. Yes, he continued to wrestle, but he also obeyed and followed God. And so maybe we're going through some kind of a situation similar. Maybe not quite as extreme as Abraham, I imagine, right? But but you know, we will continue to follow God, even if it seems like all stakes are against us. I'd like to bring us to a close. Remember that marble story. You know, the unfortunate part is I don't remember the ending of this story. But you know, that doesn't matter for our context here. I I heard this, I don't know, I think back in like 2017, somebody shared this with me. But regardless, it does not matter. We as people, we like to just make logic of things. I'm very analytical, and perhaps a lot of you are. And we like to make things work out in our minds. But you know, sometimes things are not just straight like that. Sometimes things are not black and white, wet and dry. Sometimes it's not so simple. That marble disappeared. Maybe there was a reason. Maybe it fell on something soft. Maybe somebody was in the room and quickly grabbed it. Maybe something else. And we immediately have hundreds of possibilities. But it doesn't matter. What matters is we shouldn't necessarily always look for a direct response to a question. Sometimes... Some things are not cut and dry. And sometimes in prayer, when I'm seeking, I shouldn't necessarily seek for some kind of a direct response. Maybe I should just press into Jesus and listen to him. What does he want to tell me? Outside of my analytical mind, outside of my thinking, outside of my logic, what does he want to tell me? What does he want to teach me? Maybe through this situation. And listen, maybe he says, Healing is coming soon. Maybe he says, the problem will be resolved. I will come through. Just being attentive rather than trying to solve it on our own. Rather than trying to give a response to this marble and the disappearance of it with my own thoughts. Just listening in. What does God have to say? Because God's ways, they're not our ways. And maybe it seems to us that there should be a logical response. But rather, isn't it better to just trust him? Jesus taught to be persistent to be persistent in our prayers, in our faith, to stand on his promises. He taught this, so we should do this, to stand on him, stand firm on our faith in Jesus Christ, to be persistent in our prayers. You know, it's not easy to pray sometimes. And sometimes to be persistent in this kind of a manner is actually difficult. You know, at the beginning, we discussed the story with uh, my father-in-law who would pray while the guys were watching a movie, he would continue to press into God. Things around him were set up against him. But he pressed into God. And maybe not all situations would work out according to how he would want to. Maybe not everything would be the best. But he continued to press into God. And so my friend, what about me? What about you? 
Do I continue to press into him to find that kind of a relationship with him where I'm always just seeking after him? Regardless, do I continue to press into him for my family, for myself, for my children, for my church, my city, my country, town? Do I continue to press into him and intercede and be that man that will stand before God? Do I continue to press into him? You know, when I listen to these different testimonies from our grandparents and parents and how I remember my grandpa one time when he was persecuted and he ran away from jail. Literally, God led him out of jail. When I continue to hear these things, I, I'm astonished by their faith. But what about mine? Am I that kind of a man of faith? Am I going to continue to seek after God in the same kind of a manner? Am I going to continue to be on fire for God in this kind of a manner? To be persistent, to continue to call out to Jesus, Lord, help me if I have a problem. The scripture says in the book of Hebrews, those who diligently seek him, he rewards. God will reward. God will give an answer if I diligently seek him, if I press into him, if I diligently seek. This, the author of Hebrews says those who diligently seek him. He rewards. And his reward may be that answer. His reward may be something else, but he will reward. He will come through. He will give a response. It's not easy. One guy once said, you know, imagine you were given the job to pray. You know, pray eight hours a day. How long would you last? It's not easy. Sometimes it's difficult. Sometimes it is difficult. But we as people, we are called through the scriptures to continually remain in the state of prayer. To continually remain in that kind of a mindset of spirituality where I am connecting with God. And sometimes it requires some kind of a sacrifice from our end. Many people would probably put in their resignation pretty quickly, you know, if they were given that kind of a job. But let us be those men and women that will continue to press into God regardless of the situation. How much do I want Jesus in, in my life, in my relationship with him? And that's going to depend on how much I press into him. How persistent am I in seeking him? So maybe you've let your relationship cool down with Jesus Christ. Maybe you've made some goals or promises and maybe you've broken those promises. My friend, I want to encourage you to continue to press into Jesus. Get up. Don't worry that you've broken a goal. Don't worry that maybe it's not that easy. Continue to seek after the Lord. Continue to seek Jesus Christ. How much freedom do I want from sin? Maybe, my friend, you are struggling with some kind of a sin, some kind of a battle. How much are you calling out? Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. How much are you persisting? Even if things are against you, even if this sin continues to tear you down, even if it continues to bring all this negativity into your life, how much do I continue to seek God? How much do I continue to press into Jesus, into his promise that if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed, and you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. How much do I continue to stand on this promise? How much do I continue to be persistent in this? Maybe, maybe there's a problem. Maybe I don't see a solution. How much am I continuing to press into God? How much am I, how much are you, my friend, continuing to press into Jesus Christ? And you know, not only when difficulties come, not only among struggles of sins, not only then when it seems like there's no way out, but what about just, just worshiping God? How much do I just want Him and that closeness with Him and that kind of a communion with Him to have, to have Him reveal to me His Word more and more to Him, for Him to speak to me, for me to know His character? How much am I pressing into Jesus Christ? You know, my friends, Personally, I'm speaking first and foremost to myself. How much do I want Jesus? How much I want will speak of how much I press into him. Ephesians chapter 3 verse 20 says, Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us. 
And then another part of scripture, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9. Eye has not seen, nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. The latter of these two verses we often hear, and we hear that it's related to our afterlife, to heaven, to paradise. But you know, when we really meditate on this, no eye has seen or ear heard what God prepared for you and me. I think that can be now, today. The things that God prepared for his children are at work right now. Because, because the Apostle Paul says to the Ephesians that more than I can imagine, more than I can even think to myself, God does so much more through the spirit that lives inside of me. My friend, God can do more. More than I can imagine more than even the things that my eyes can, can imagine or my ears can hear with the imagination more today, right now, if I press into him, if I stand on his promises, if I stand on Jesus Christ, if I hold firm to him, if I, like this Canaanite woman, continue to follow after Jesus through the silence, through the times when it seems like maybe I'm not the mission, through the times when it seems like I might be nothing, worthless dog, I will continue to press in. And finally, I won't just receive crumbs. No, my friend, I will receive an entire dinner. Like that woman, she was granted not just a crumb. No, that woman was granted an entire dinner table. She was granted, she was granted grace. She was granted the entire grace and her child, her daughter was freed because she persisted. She continued to press into Jesus Christ, to the Lord, to the Savior, and she believed in him as the Messiah. She believed in Jesus Christ. At the beginning of the service, Brother Vitaly, he spoke about standing firm in our faith, the one that we receive to stand firm, not to be wobbling around or to shake, not to look at all the different philosophies or all these other things, but to stand firm, to walk in Christ. And you know, Vitaly and I, we didn't agree on this, but you know, that fits right in line that we ought to be those people that will continue to walk in Christ. We won't listen to what this world offers us. We won't listen to all the different philosophies around us or all these other things. No, I will press into Jesus. I won't listen to the attacks of Satan that say that I cannot, but no, I will press in and I won't receive a crumb, but I will receive a dinner from Jesus Christ and he will serve me and I will dine with him. God, I want you more than I can imagine in my relationship with you. In the problems I face, in the mountains I climb, in the struggles I go through, I want you more. I want you more and I want to stand on those promises more than I can imagine. Let that be our prayer today. And if we're going through some kind of a situation, let us press into Jesus. If we're not going through some kind of a situation, let us still press into Jesus because we're saying the song that his name is worthy. Jesus' name is worthy regardless of what I'm going through. Even if I'm going through a difficulty, even if I'm going through a struggle, the name of Jesus is worthy. And so like this Canaanite woman, I will continue to follow Jesus. I will worship him. I will bow down before him because he is the King of Kings. Jesus is God. Jesus is Lord of all and there is none other. And I know he will come through and help me regardless of what I'm going through. And I know he will come through and reveal himself deeper to me. And I know he will come through and I will have a deeper communion, a deeper fellowship with him. Let that kind of a prayer be our prayer today, my friends. Let us stand and pray. Amen. Jesus, we thank you for the time that we have here. We thank you that you continue to bless. We thank you that you continue to care. Even when things are set up against us, even if, when it sounds like there's silence, even if it sounds like things are set up against us and maybe words in this world and something else, we thank you that you are there. And that when we persist, when we continually seek you, you said those who call out to you, the children day and night, you will give a response because you're not some kind of a wicked judge. No, on the contrary, you will because you love your children. And we want to be those men and those women that will press into you. We want to be those men and women that will seek after you. We want you to be the one that will say of us, 
This is my child. He is after my heart. This is my daughter. She is after my heart. And she fulfills the desires of my heart. We pray that you would do that kind of a work in us, that we would press deeper into you and desire you, desire you more. Even if we don't have difficulties, let us not relapse, let us not relax, but rather let us even continue to more and more seek after you, to seek after you, after your character, after your desires, to seek what you want in our lives. We pray and ask that you would continue that kind of work in my heart and in the hearts of my brothers and my sisters that you would continue the work and give us even a greater zeal just like brother Vitaly said that we would return to that first love that we would return to that zeal that we had when we first came to you I pray Jesus that you would do this kind of work in my life in my heart in the in the lives of my brothers and my sisters please do this kind of work We desire you more and we want to have a deeper communion with you. We want to be those that will continue and continue and continue to press and press into you, Jesus Christ. Not looking at the fact that things around us might be against us. We will continue and help us live that kind of a life where we seek after you. Our mindset that it may be set on the spiritual things, on the things above and not on the things below, that we may be set completely on you, that our eyes may be set on you. Please do that kind of a work because your scripture says that you with your spirit that lives inside of us can do and will do so much more than we can imagine. We thank you for this. We thank you. We thank you for your goodness in our lives. We thank you that you were the one that chose us, that found us while we were in sins, and that we can now have that communion with you, that we can have fellowship with you, that we can know your heart, that we can come to you freely, that we can call you Lord, the Messiah, God. We thank you. We thank you. We thank you so much for your goodness that you continue to pour out. And just like the Apostle Paul says, we want to be those men and women that will bring and throw everything to you. Just like the Apostle Peter says, to bring our cares and cast them on you, we will be those men and women that will do so. We will because we trust, we believe. And I pray that you would strengthen our faith, that we, our faith, it would not, it would not shake, but rather that it would be even more firm on you. Please bless each and every one of us. And not just when we come to this place, but even in our everyday lives, continue your work in us, in our hearts, in our families, in our church, in our city, our country. Continue your work because we need you. Because without you, we are nothing, just as you said. And we we want to be those that will continue to press in, that will continue to press into you. So you can continue to minister to one another while you leave the church. Uh, You can continue to minister to your friends, neighbors. And by the way, if you are first time here and you are a guest, I want you to our local people to connect. If you see some uh, unfamiliar faces, just come out and greet them. May God uh, lead you and uh, um, invite each other, encourage each other. Uh, We bless you. May God bless you. And we as ministers, we will stay here if you need a special prayer. Or maybe you have a special request that you want us just to um, advise you or pray with you. We'll be here. Let us just finish in a short prayer.